That district, end of the year, people said, okay, how much uh, did we produce uh, last year? Well, we produced this many tons. Okay, add 25,000 tons to it. So it's That's how it works. If you want data on rice production, you go to FAO tables, and you can get very, very good numbers, except that they're provided by the ministries of the countries, and they'll be from two years ago. How much does that help? So we've been working with our partners very closely here in the Philippines especially to develop tools that allow us to estimate what the production is. And this whole question of, uh, of uh, managing and developing the information, the, the, the Philippine rice information together with remote sensing uh, uh, programs of a, a company in Switzerland, the national systems, are allowing us to put together the tools that will enable us to get real information, real-time information, about what we expect from the rice crop. And that's coming from data from outer space, satellites, which is really kind of neat. If you think about the work that we're doing here, I talked about work at the molecular level, talked about work at the field level, we're working from outer space. Complete continuum, across scales. And we can, using the, the, the most modern technologies, map with incredible detail our uh, rice production. And what's really neat about these satellites that have come up from the European Space Agency is that they can take images in the dark and they can see through clouds. In the past, when you took pictures from satellites of rice during the monsoon season, which is the main season for rice in Southeast Asia, you got beautiful pictures of clouds. which don't really tell you very much, okay, except that it's probably raining, which you could tell if you were on the ground. Um, but with today's technology, we can map with incredible precision. We're going to be down to six square meters, telling where the rice. We can tell when the rice was planted. We can tell when it's harvested. It gives us a very, very good idea connected with our crop growth models as to what the yield would be. This really came home in October when we had Typhoon Lando went through and sat over the Philippines and dumped a lot of rain and really caused a problem. It was in the middle of the board meeting here, remember last October? And um, Secretary Alcala came, I think he, the, the storm finished like on Tuesday. He came to the board meeting on Thursday and said, I need to tell the president on Saturday, what the losses from the typhoon were. I said, eh, no problem. <laughs> Adam, take care of it. <laughs> Three, you didn't want to sleep. Um, but at any rate, because we had this system, we could put together very detailed estimates. And the secretary was able to meet the president, the president of Kino, and tell him, that according to these estimates and these are the data, these are the, we went down to the field level, what was flooded, what wasn't, and when, what was harvested already, what happened there. Looks like it's about 1.1 million tons lost. That kind of information is extremely important for government to know. Some folks are going to say, losses, 10 million tons, Philippines is going to starve, import everything, pay no matter price, no matter what. Others are going to say, that's ah, all okay. Nothing like real data to help guide proper decision making. And we see that our role in the globe is incredibly important. Focused on rice, but rice is so important that the information we provide will be critical. And we see ourselves developing information gateways that will allow policymakers to make informed decisions. We can help guide those decisions because we know the technologies that are coming down. We know how we can change the existing situation. And I think that's something that's really exciting. That's part of what's expected from here. And here is, make, again, arrogant. We are expected to be leaders in the world. And we are. And I was thinking about this. I mean, what is leadership is basically getting people to do the right thing. 
and they're happy to do it. That's what leadership is. Not telling people what to do, but you get people to understand what the right thing to do, and they're excited about it. And they're really, really struck home Perry's leadership when the governments of India, Bangladesh, and Nepal signed an agreement that each would recognize their varietal approval processes so that when a material was approved in one country, it could be immediately used in all the other two countries. That means that you could have a variety created in India, and the next year it could be grown in Bangladesh, while well, previously you have a variety created in India, they take it to Bangladesh, take it through six years of testing before it can get out to farmers. This meant bureaucrats had to swallow their pride and say, we will accept the data of this other country. And that's OK when you think, well, Nepal accepted it. But imagine India saying, we accept the data from Nepal and we'll release. That takes real courage. And I, I just want to recognize the gentleman second from your right, uh, Ashish Paraguna, Secretary of Agriculture. Tremendously courageous individual. Bureaucrat, not an agriculture scientist. But he understood what was holding things back, and it was bureaucratic red tape. And anything he could do to cut that red tape, he did. And I just have such admiration for people like that, who can go out and who can do that and take the decisions and do the right thing. And I, was, I visited him uh, two weeks ago in Delhi because we'd become his friends. And uh, he was, you know, you know, thanking Yuri for going. I was congratulating him. It was a real love fest. It was fun. Uh, but the point is, you need to have individual courage to make change. Even when you're working in an institution that's supposed to drive that change. And he really showed that. And I was really, I'm proud to call him, proud to call him my friend. So we're looking at it down the road ahead of us. We've got a tremendous surge of technologies coming through. It's just fantastic. We will change the way rice is grown. We will change the world for a better place. We know that we will have, we we'll already see it happen. People will be living better lives, They'll be better nourished. They will have other problems. Now, we're not going to take people's problems away, they're just have different problems. But I guarantee you they're not going to look back and say, boy, we're just thinking of battle in the good old days when we were starving to death. I wish that was my problem, but that's not the case. And there's great demand for the work we're doing. And of course, the increased risk of catastrophic losses just further, further the demand. I have I asked if I could get away with giving a presentation about without mentioning the CGIAR. <laughs> I was told in no uncertain terms, no Bob, you have to talk about the CGIAR. CGIAR is an excellent 15th century. <laughs> anyway. Here was the first Saturday now, I, and I've said this before, Erie was here before there was a CGIR, will be around after there's a CGIR. But the fact is the CGIR has gone through the reform process. One of, I think, the great successes of the reform process was the facilitation of the creation of the Global Life Science Partnership. I think it's just fantastic that the writing team, or some of the writing teams are here. Bringing together all of the major institutions with global mandates on rice research is a wonderful consequence of the reform process. Like many very good things, it was an unintended consequence, but it was a consequence of the reform process, and we took great advantage. We actually started creating GRIST before there was the CGI on reform process. And so I am confident that no matter what happens to the CGI AR, this Global Rice Science Partnership will continue. And it's a really, really good thing. It's not perfect. We have kinks to work out. Uh, but all of us who are members do believe it's the right way to go. And it is, it offers fantastic opportunity for 
so many partners around the world. And if you dig deep into it, and you look at the research projects, the partners, how the programs are distributed, you can see that that richness, richness is just not on paper. It is, in fact, the pie chart simply represents the proportion of work that's devoted to different projects in different areas and different aspects of the program. And you can see that it's well distributed. And you can just go layer on layer and you see that it is, in fact, a very, very rich program. Rich in the sense of diversity um, and ideas. So what is the state of the CGIAR? Well, we're involved in a complete reorganization. Some of us would be forgiven if we were to say, I told you so. I told you so. Exactly what was going to happen. Complete failure, almost, with the exception of risk. Yeah, with the exception of risk. Consortium is going to be disbanded in 2016. There will be a single governance program set up. I think the jury is still out as to whether or not this is rearranging the deck chairs on the sinking ship. We don't know that yet. There is no doubt in my mind that Erie continues to be valued by its donors, that risk will continue. But funding for the next year or two to the CGIR is just going to be uncertain. Just got to make, it's going to be a, a year or two of, of uncertainty. Maybe three, I don't think so. A year or two of uncertainty. But we will come back. And, and it's, uh, remember 2008. Global financial meltdown. Investors, I am bored. <laughs> investors, investors came to the U.S. put their money in U.S. Treasury bills for zero percent interest. It's called a flight to safety, and that's what's going to happen with Erie. When, it come, when push comes to shove, our donors are going to say, we have money, we have to invest in development. Where can we invest it that we know will have a good impact, that will be used wisely? It will come to Erie, it will come to Grisk. Okay, wrapping up, please. Afternoon is still young. I came across this picture and I was thinking about change and transition. This was a picture taken in 2005. See how much younger I was. The, um, this was a meeting of Gary and Simic. We were talking about our alliance. And I went through and I put a circle around every scientist from Gary. These are senior people leading major program, major aspects of the Institute. And I said, well, how many of them are still here? <laughs> They're almost all gone. But Erie is still vibrant and still healthy. So I think that's an important lesson. You have turnover, even in senior positions, but the Institute remains healthy and strong. It's got a great mission, a great vision, great people all in all. Some of those aren't going to be around. There's a couple here going to be uh, gone in a month or two. But the Institute is still healthy. You also notice that the pictures that are white so forth aren't completely opaque. And that's because we actually still interact with most, almost all of these people. So there is a change. Then, then I started to think, this was a was pioneer interview with Gene Hill. Got to, be, got to think about staff turnover. And then data from HR. About the turnover time. Average tenure of an IRS in Erie is seven years. Average for an NRS is over 20. And people talk about that. I got to think, oh, this is a really, really good design. The big circle, the big gear, NRS turns over slowly. IRS turning over much more quickly. IRS postdocs turning over even more quickly. New ideas coming in. Absorbed in the institution, come around, take in new ideas, 
IRS come and go, national staff stay longer, goes around a couple of times, new IRS comes in, assuming the NRS has courage and says, oh, by the way, we tried that and it didn't work for this reason and that reason. <laughs> Not that that would ever happen before. <laughs> but the point is, I think this is a brilliant design. You don't see that in many institutions. It's innovative, it's, it's transformational, but it's stable. And I think that's something that we need to analyze further. I'm sure, Chris, you don't have much to do, so. But this is, I think, the kind of thing that keeps Erie so vibrant. How do we keep coming with innovation, with innovation, with innovation? Well, I think that has a lot to do with it. You talk to me, I've mean, talked about the next generation. This is me out in the village in India. Saw this little rice farmer. Thought I'd give an Erie hat. And uh, my dream, or a dream, this is not on the list of things that drive me crazy, by the way, is that in 20 years I'll still have my health and I can go back and see this young fellow as a graduate of the University of Larissa Agriculture and Technology and being a very sophisticated farm manager in that village. So we are. This is sunrise over Vanahau. I think we are the dawn of a new day and it's a new era. And I am in many ways sorry for leaving. It's been an unbelievable 10 years, a little more. Kristen put up with my dedication. And I could never have done it with from the bottom of my heart. And so that's it. That, I didn't go as long as I thought. I did, I, I meant to bring to the box. Yeah, what, one of the things, I sent you all an email, I sent all to all Erie staff, last week, early this Monday, I think, I sent a message to all Erie staff and I asked for questions. I wanted, I wanted you to send me your questions, but I, I, wanted, I didn't want to call. When I call on people, nobody raises their hands. So I got everybody to send me, wanted to ask me a question, to send me questions. Many of you did. If you didn't get a request for a question, come to Marco, because you probably have your settings wrong. Anyway, so I thought I would just take some random questions here. This one, this question is from Helia Castilla. Did you use it really as a career study? 
me so to advance your selfish. <laughs> have you no shame? Have you no decency? <laughs> you ain't very small. <laughs>
life science in the CGR. You mentioned it three times uh, in your, your speech in the end of both. At that time, we no collaboration. Actually, Africa Rise, at the time, more than here, were not in speaking terms. Can you imagine the waste, the enormous waste of opportunities there? And then through one man, Bob Ziegler, he changed that. And I think, Bob, that's because you worked in Latin America, you worked in Africa, and you worked in Asia. And I think it's his vision, really, that led to a team being sent to what was still war at the time uh, in 2007. Uh, when people started thinking about working together in Africa, Sia, Kiri, and Africa Rise. And Bob came, February 2008, the big director general of Kiri, came to Africa Rise company with a little sister, and a sister, I remember Dr. Tor, who was the leader in DBG, to talk about creating a global partnership on Rice. And Bob, we launched also the, uh, works, the, the first version on Strasse. You said, let's do that in Africa. I think all these gestures were extremely important. And Bob, uh, I think we have grown from strengths to strengths. Honestly, uh, we, we still have some things to, that we can do better. But we will learn from our failures, as you said. We don't hide them. We will go from strength to strength. And um, honestly, on behalf uh, of Africa Rights, and I think on behalf of all partners here that are in the writing workshop, we promise you to continue working under that big umbrella of Global Rights Science Partnership. And I'm sure Matthew and I know my new boss, Errol Roy, we call it, uh, really are behind that. So I wish you really good luck. Visit yourself, your family, good luck. And uh, I hope to uh, see you soon again. Thanks so much. Uh, because the time is now, I would not to occupy this um, your time anymore. And there was this room where we had other events were going on. So here, as the normal third seminars, we also did them with questions. This is a certificate from a third seminar. And before, this certificate was signed by Dr. Zika, and this time it was signed by Dr. Morgan. Thank you.